In Focus, my guest today attended New Mexico State University with a major in business administration. During college, he worked as a roughneck in New Mexico and Colorado and started his first business before finishing school. It's led to a long career in one of New Mexico's most important industries, oil and gas. I'm pleased to welcome Barry Mullinax, the president and CEO of Panther Energy, based in Oklahoma. Barry, thank you for being with us. Thank you. So to start off with, uh, tell me a little bit about coming back to New Mexico State and uh, what, what it was like as well for you as a student here. Um, well, this is the first time I've been back to New Mexico State since 1983. So uh, campus has changed a lot. When I went to school here, uh, the town was probably a third the size. Um, I actually started um, at San Juan College in Farmington and attended there my first two years before transferring down here. So most of the friends I had were from Farmington, but uh, it was a smaller community. Um, I enjoyed it. The, the, the uh, scenery and the location of Las Cruces is just a great place to go to school. Yeah, and it's, it has grown a lot since the 1980s. Uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, you worked uh, as a roughneck while still in school. For people who are not familiar with that job, explain what it is to us and what it was like for you as a student doing that job. Um, well, when I uh, left high school and decided I wanted to go to school, my father helped me get a small scholarship to go to San Juan College. But uh, as far as the paying for the rest of the tuition and food and everything else, car, uh, he basically said, get yourself a job. So um, I went out and found the highest paying job I could find, which at that time was working in the oil and gas field. I had two brothers that worked for Halliburton in the Farmington camp, and um, I went to work for Four Corners Drilling. And it, it's basically a very dangerous job. It's working on the floor of a drilling rig, uh, working tongs or derricks or uh, constantly fixing broken equipment. Uh, getting into the, the, the cellar of the drilling rig and tightening pipes while there's gas and oil leaking out of it. Uh, people typically lose fingers and hands. It's a, it's a rough job and uh, 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 all it made me do was realize I didn't want to be a roughneck for a living. Mm. You started your first business before finishing school, so you, you were really busy during school, not only having jobs but starting a business. Tell me about that. Um, I think I always knew that I wanted to start and own my own businesses. Um, even as a young kid, I was throwing newspapers at 12 or 13 years old. <laughs> and uh, um, when I left college and went to Dallas uh, before I finished, uh, my mom had moved to, to Dallas and I moved over there to help her for a few months. And I, uh, my brother had just left Halliburton, uh, had been laid off in the Middle East uh, because it was the mid 80s, uh, early to mid 80s and oil prices were going uh, into the floor. Uh, so he got laid off and him and I decided to start a painting and remodeling company in Dallas and uh, we had no idea what we were doing. Uh, we walked into a bank, got a $1,500 loan, um, uh, convinced a loan officer to give us money. Uh, we had some other money of our own. We bought a few pickup trucks, hired a few people, bought some painting equipment, and we were off to the races. Um, we. Uh, actually grew that business over a couple of years and then sold it uh, before I got back into the oil and gas business. Wow. Uh, you're now giving back, talking to students, including right here at New Mexico State, about your career. Tell me about that and what you try to impart. Um, I started my first oil and gas company after working for a broker dealership in, in uh, Dallas. Um, moved to Oklahoma and uh, basically with a television and a suitcase um, and started buying up uh, small interest in wells there. Uh, ran into my existing partner uh, who I've been partners with uh, over five companies and 29 years. Uh, You're so good friends. <laughs> yes, we're, we're, well, he calls me uh, his office wife and I call it my office wife. So, <laughs> um, you know, he is a, a, an engineer and I'm the business guy and we have separate uh, goals in the company. We don't step on each other's toes and uh, he finds all the oil and gas and I do all the financing and legal and uh, negotiating for the deals. Mm. And so you talk, I guess, with students a lot about that and how that works. I do. I, uh, I've spoken here at the university and at other universities about 
entrepreneurship and financing. And what I try to impart to students is to keep your options open um, and think spatially instead of linearly. Uh, I tell students if you if your life ends up like you think it's going to end up today, you're a very lucky person. Uh, typically, our lives go in much different directions than we intend them to. And, and, and I tell students, take some risks and keep your options open. Yeah, adaptability is, is key. Uh, a lot of what your success uh, and talking about that success involves is raising capital. I know that oil and gas is a very capital intensive business. Give me uh, a sense of how difficult this is for some firms and how you do it. Um, well, the difficulty sometimes can be related to oil and gas prices. It's more difficult when prices are low. Uh, I've used every type of financing you can use from uh, private equity to bank debt to mezzanine debt to volumetric production payments. Uh, these are all typical finance vehicles for oil and gas. Um, and it was difficult early on when you first start your company. We used multiple types of financing. Uh, our first company, we raised uh, probably $50 million over the course of uh, 11 or 12 years, but we did it from six different sources, and it was small amounts from each one of them, and that was my first company. My fifth company, I picked up a phone and raised $375 million uh, with a phone call. So. The difficulty can be based on, on not just oil and gas prices, but also success. They're, they're, you know, we are not a legacy oil and gas company, so financing, raising capital is what we do. We build companies and sell them. Uh, we're not a legacy company. So the financing is the, the biggest part of what we do. Um, and it gets easier over time and success, but it can be difficult. Yeah. Um, the oil and gas industry, of course, is the single most important industry in New Mexico in terms of our state budget. Very important to a lot of uh, people, including I'm sure some people watching as well for employment or employment of family. Uh, give us a sense of where the industry is right now. I know for a while th this was difficult because prices were were so low uh, and people were getting laid off, but now price is going back up again and we're seeing higher employment levels? Um, the the industry's recovering. I don't know if jobs are recovering as quickly because mm -hmm. efficiency is driving everything. I live in Oklahoma and, and like New Mexico, one in five jobs in Oklahoma is related to the oil and gas industry. 25% of the state's revenue comes from the oil and gas industry. And it also is heavily tied to the industry. but. What's happened over the last few years as oil prices have gone from $27 back up to $65 a barrel is that efficiencies are driving everything. Um, it, it's, it's not as freewheeling as it used to be in the cost side. Um, I know one company, Public Independent in Tulsa, who today is at uh, 1,500 employees and they had 4,000 employees when oil prices dropped uh, to $27 a barrel. And today they're making almost twice as much oil with one third the employees. Hmm. So people are much more efficient about how they spend. Investors in companies are much more focused on return on investment now instead of just growing reserve value like they used to be. So um, I, I think the industry is on its way to recovery. I, I, I just don't think that uh, we're out of the weeds yet because we have not uh, recovered the employment that we lost. What do you enjoy most about working in, in the industry? Uh, the people. I, I really do enjoy the people that we work with, the people that I meet, uh, because we work with people across all industries. I, I mean, we, we have to work with government officials on regulation. We have to work with environmental people on environmental issues. We work with banks and finance people. We, you know, uh, oil and gas in Oklahoma, I'm not sure about New Mexico, but I know in Oklahoma the, the secondary impact of uh, the oil and gas industry is billions of dollars mm. um, in how it touches all other industries, home building and everything else. So, um, And I just love working with all these people. Um, the construction industry, it's all a part of the oil and gas industry. On the flip side, what's, what would you say is the biggest challenge for you? 
Uh, I think the biggest challenge right now is getting people to understand the need for our industry. I think we're very polarized uh, in this country, and I think that uh, you know people need to understand that we need fossil fuels, and we're going to need them for decades to come. Um, and the growth in oil demand is over a million barrels per day per year. It grows, and there's projections that it'll be 1.3 or higher in coming years. Um, so I think people need to understand that, that uh, there's still a billion people in this planet that heat their food with wood and dung, and they want a lifestyle like ours. And part of that, those people will not skip right to wind and solar. There, there is going to be a need for fossil fuels, and even though we use a lot more electric vehicles in this country than other countries, um, there's still uh, electric vehicles are less than 1% of the fleet of the world, mm. of the millions of vehicles that are on the road in the world. And uh, uh, in this country, it's low single digits. So it's, it's grown dramatically here, but we don't live in a bubble. Uh, energy is a worldwide commodity. And I think people need to understand, uh, regardless of what your position is on climate change, that fossil fuels are here. And the thing we should do is work to use them as efficiently as we, we can while we um, find other sources of energy and not demonize one or the other. Yeah, and of course, you mentioned electric vehicles. Very often, they would be charged by an electric plant run by natural gas. Correct. So, again, that, that illustrates the point really well. You are, as I said earlier, giving back, talking to students at New Mexico State, and you mentioned at other schools. To close out today, what, uh, what other advice would you have uh, for, for students who might be watching this or parents who want to give that advice to their kids? Um, well, as I said before, just keep your options open. Uh, but I would say be tenacious. I mean, at whatever you do, be tenacious. Um, make your presence known. Because um, your life is not going to end up in the same place that you think it is and you have to take risks, but I, I, I would say just stick to it. Just make your goals and stick to them. And what a journey that can be sometimes, right? <laughs> it can be because <laughs> I, I can tell you when I was at, uh, I started out as a electrical engineering major at New Mexico State and took an economics class and had a aha moment and uh, changed the, my life dramatically from that moment on. Uh, but I also never thought that I would be the CEO of multiple oil and gas companies when I was 20 years old here at New Mexico State University. And you are the only person I've ever spoken with who has made a phone call and raised $375 million. <laughs> maybe, maybe you're the only person I'll ever talk to who's done that, so that's pretty cool. It Barry. may have been two or three phone calls. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Barry Mullinex, he is the president and CEO of Panther Energy. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you at home as well in Focus.